So good to see you guys. Thank you for being here for Easter. I'm Pastor Danny. If you are new to Bayshore or somebody invited you today, your family or friends, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. And uh, we're just honored to have you with us today. And uh, I, I'm glad the spring is here. It's still a little cold, but spring is on the way. That's what I love about Easter. One of the things that, you know, spring is almost there and you're there. And uh, I always have friends that go to Florida in the winter time for a little bit. And, you know, I think that spoils it for people in Delaware. You come back and you, and what people that stay here and you don't go anywhere. You, and when spring gets here, it's really awesome, right? You know, so anyhow, we're just so glad that you're with us and that spring is here. And uh, we're delighted to have you here this morning. We are going to, what we do here at Bayshore is we kind of teach the Bible, how it makes sense to us and um, how Jesus reveals himself in the word. And so Today, what I'd like to do is take a scripture that is in the book of Galatians that I think kind of paints the picture a little bit for what Easter and holidays are about and uh, how Jesus fits into that. And it's one of my favorite scriptures. It's in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. And uh, it says this, it says, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to a sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. I'd like to read one more scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8. Paul writes again, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brethren and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, And last of all, he appeared to me as one abnormally born. What's great about the scripture we've read in Galatians is it sort of uh, says this. It says that Jesus came at the perfect time in history, that he came like at the right moment. Now that it's spring, some of us that have gardens, I don't have a garden, but some of you have gardens and, you know, you, you, you can't plant your seeds in February when the ground's frozen. You can't plant your corn or your string beans, you know, in the wintertime. You've got to wait for the, wait for the right season to uh, plant your, uh, your crops for, the, for your garden. Uh, my theory is don't have a garden, have friends that have gardens. That's a good way to get stuff out of the garden. But here's the thing about, you know, gardens. Gardens come at the right time, and the seed has to be planted at the right time. The book of Galatians here says that Jesus came at the perfect time in history. Now, we know historically he was born when Herod the Great was king. Herod died in 6 B.C., and so people believe that uh, Jesus was born about 4 B.C., He was crucified about 33 A.D. So we kind of know when he was born in history. And so the Apostle Paul, he writes this. He said, at just the right time, at the right moment, at the set time, or at the perfect time, Jesus came into the world. Now, what we have to think about, first of all, is who wrote this in the book of Galatians, this story that says that Jesus was born at the right time. What was the man that wrote that? Well, this is the Apostle Paul. If you're like new to Christianity or new to church, new to the Bible, the Apostle Paul wrote about half of the New Testament, 13 letters that he wrote in the New Testament. There's 27 uh, books in the New Testament And Paul wrote like half of those. So he's an interesting guy. But what's interesting about him is that Paul was not always a believer. Paul, in fact, was an anti-believer. He was against Jesus. He was against the people that followed Jesus. And he saw Jesus and his movement as a real threat to what his worldview was, that Judaism, being a Jew, and following the law was what was really important. So he took it upon himself, and he wanted to go persecute the people that were following Jesus. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy that he was a a persecutor and a violent man. 
So what does that mean that he was a persecutor and a violent man? Evidently, he would even interrogate people that believed in Jesus, tormenting them, torturing them, trying to get them to deny their faith. And so this is an an adversary of Christianity. So you have to ask the question, how did that guy end up writing half of the New Testament? That is an interesting question. How did he go from hating Jesus? How did he go from hating Christians to all of a sudden being a great preacher of Christianity, planting churches, and writing the New Testament? Well, the answer to that is is that he had a vision, or not a vision, he actually experienced the resurrection of Jesus two years after Jesus was raised from the tomb on Easter. So we're talking about a late Easter comer. This is a guy that, you know, when Jesus was raised from the dead, the first disciples, Mary Magdalene and uh, the women that loved Jesus, and we have the, uh, the apostles that loved Jesus, they saw Jesus, they believed in it, they were convinced Jesus' brother by the name of James, who wrote one of the New Testament books, the book of James, uh, he was a brother of Jesus, half-brother. He was Joseph and Mary's uh, another son of them, and uh, he didn't believe in Jesus. You know, somebody said, you know, what would you have to do, what would you have to do to convince your brother you were the son of God, you know? Uh, so James didn't believe, but the Bible says that James became a believer, and he became the, the leader of the early church. So what happened to Paul? What happened to James? But let's focus on what happened to Paul. What made him change his mind? Well, the Bible says that he was on the road to Damascus, uh, this place in northern Syria. He was going to get more Christians, put them in jail, put them in chains, bring them back to Jerusalem, torment them, torture them, get them to deny Christ. And he was in, his, in a mission to do that. He had some people with him. And uh, he's coming into Damascus. And he's coming there. And it says it was at noon. It was noon, high noon. The sun was high in the sky. All of a sudden, Paul saw this blinding light. And he heard a voice. And the voice said to him, his, his name used to be Saul. That's his Hebrew name. Paul is his Gentile name. He heard this voice say to him, In Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul was like, what in the world? He said, well, who are you, Lord? Who are you? And he heard and he saw Jesus and Jesus said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So he got completely radically changed. He goes into Damascus. Uh, He prays for three days, and then he's baptized in water. And this guy who did not believe in Jesus becomes a believer in Jesus. Now, you know what that tells me? That tells me that it must be pretty convincing what Paul experienced for him to change his direction completely in his life. He did a 180, a 180. He was going this way. He sees Jesus raised from the dead. He doesn't believe it. He doesn't think it. He doesn't, before this, he doesn't think it's possible. He thinks Jesus is a fraud. He thinks Jesus is all made up. He thinks it's a bunch of baloney. And he has this experience with the resurrection of Jesus. And he sees Jesus two years after he was raised from the dead. And he became a follower of Jesus. And from that point on, he did this amazing U turn. Now, what's a U turn? How many have ever made a U-turn? You made a U-turn, your wife says, you're going the wrong way. You make a U-turn. And you make a U-turn because you're going the wrong way. And he realized that he was going the wrong way. There's people here today that are part of Bayshore, if you're new here. There's people here today that have done a U-turn in their life. They've done a complete U-turn. They used to, you know, not be for Jesus. They used to be against Jesus. They used to use profanity. They used to be in all kinds of addiction issues. And and all of us still struggle with stuff that we had before we met Jesus. But our lives have taken a U-turn. And Paul's life took a U-turn. If somebody asks me, could you give one reason why you believe that Easter is true and the resurrection is true, I would say Paul. That would be my short answer, that Paul is the greatest explanation 
that Jesus has been raised from the dead. We had a, a student a few years ago at our, uh, that came on Easter Sunday to our Rehoboth campus, and he doesn't, didn't know the Lord, and somebody invited him, and he loved the music, and he, he heard the message about the resurrection, and he said, like, that is crazy. I can't believe something like that could happen. It was completely berserk to him that that could happen. Now, the people in, in the Bible, they are just like you. They're not like, they weren't like buffoons and they just believed anything. They were skeptics just like us. They didn't believe it. Paul didn't believe it. But he saw Jesus raised from the dead and then he was convinced that it was true. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Paul saw him. Paul spent the rest of his life preaching about Jesus, planning churches. And at the end of his life in 64 AD, the emperor Nero says, you deny Christ or I'm going to kill you. And because Paul was a Roman citizen, he wasn't crucified, he wasn't abused, but because he was a Roman citizen, he was beheaded for his faith. Now, what made, what would make a man do that? How about James, the guy that we mentioned, the brother of Jesus, who says in John chapter 7, his brothers didn't believe him. They thought he was a nutcase. One time they went and they just, they thought he was, he'd lost his mind. But the Bible says that Jesus appeared to James, his brother, uh, after Easter. And James, who did not believe in Jesus, the resurrected Jesus appeared to his brother, and James says, wow, it is true. And he became a disciple of Jesus, and he became the leader of the early church. And sometime around, I think it was the late 50s, 59 AD, he was persecuted for preaching Jesus in the, in the city of Jerusalem. The, all the religious leaders wanted to shut down the Jesus movement. So what did they do? Well, they, they tried to get rid of James, and they took James. They said, if you don't deny the Lord, we're going to take you to the top of the temple, and we're going to throw you off the temple and kill you. And James says, I will never deny the one that I've seen. I will never deny the, the Jesus that I know that's alive. And they took James, and they took him to the top of the temple, and they threw him off the temple, and then they clubbed him to death when he hit the ground. This is historically true. I just have to ask you a question. How would a man do that if it's not true? These people that died for their faith saw Jesus physically raised from the dead, and they were convinced it's true, and they made a U-turn. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, I would say to you, go party have a good time, make as much money as you can, make your own rules up, do whatever you want to, have fun, because none of this is true. J, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says, if Jesus is true, if the resurrection is true, then there's all kinds of implications for it. That means that one day we're going to stand before a God that we are accountable to because Jesus is true. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead, then nobody else is ever going to be raised from the dead. That when we die, that's it. But because Jesus has been raised from the dead, people that know him will live forever. And their resurrected bodies, their bodies cremated, whatever happens to the body. 1 Corinthians 15 says, because Jesus has been raised from the dead, he's the first fruit of the resurrection. My mother uh, my, my, uh, my aunt, people that I love, people that you love, people that knew Jesus, that's not the end of the story because Jesus has been raised from the dead. And here's what we know. So Paul, he gets, he meets Jesus. It's real. So what does he do? He starts going back to the Bible, to the Old Testament. He's been reading since he was a kid. He starts reading it. And all of a sudden he sees it in new eyes, fresh eyes. He sees this. This is really, this is what it meant when it says in Isaiah 53, that he was, he bore our transgression. He was pierced. He was pierced for our iniquities. Isaiah 53, 9 says he was pierced for our iniquities. 700 years before Jesus came to the earth, it said how he was going to die. How he was going to die. He was going to be pierced. His hands were going to have nails put through them. His feet, nails put through them. His side, a sword put through them. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe. One of the disciples just showing you, you know, they're, no, they're just like us. One of those disciples said, hey, listen, you know, I don't believe. Thomas says, if I, unless I can see him, 
Unless I can see him with my eyes, unless I can touch him with my hands, I will never believe this. So the next time that they were all together, Jesus appears and he looks at Thomas. And Thomas says, and Jesus says to Thomas, Thomas, come and see that it's me. Put your hand in my side. I'm not a ghost. I'm not, a, you're not having a vision. You're not hallucinating. This is true. And Thomas went to India and became a great speaker, great preacher of the faith in India. So apostle after apostle after apostle was, had witnessed the resurrection of Jesus, and they went to the Old Testament, and they could see that now it's being confirmed in the Old Testament. There's 48 main prophecies in the Old Testament that point to Jesus coming. 48 prophecies. There's a guy named Peter Stoner. Peter Stoner was, is a, was a mathematician, astronomer of Pasadena uh, College in California, and he did this study What is the probability, his big thing was probability, and by the way, his book, Science Speaks by Peter Stoner, has been peer-reviewed by other scientists and other mathematicians. And Peter Stoner said, the probability of Jesus in the first century fulfilling just eight of those prophecies, just eight of those prophecies, uh, the probability is 10 to the 17th power, which means 1 to 10 with 17 zeros beside it. That's not very good odds, is it? That's not very good odds. Peter Stoner says, to help you understand this and to help people like me understand this, he said, what that means is if you took the whole state of Texas and you covered the whole state of Texas in silver dollars and they were two feet deep and you took one of those silver dollars and you marked an X on it, you threw it into the state of Texas, you mixed up all those silver dollars and you blindfolded a man And you told him to wander in Texas and pick up the very coin that has the X on it. That's a probability of one man fulfilling just eight of the prophecies in the first century. So Peter Stoner said, well, what about all 48? What if you put all 48, what's the probability of Jesus, uh, like in Isaiah uh, 53, it says that he'll be buried with the rich He'll be assigned a grave with the rich in his death. Matthew 27 says that Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, went and got the body of Jesus, and he laid the body of Jesus in his own tomb, the tomb of a rich man. 700 years before that, Peter Stoner said, well, what if we took 48 48 of those prophecies, what's the probability that Jesus or one man in the first century could fulfill all those? He said it's 1 to 10 to the 157th power. You put 157 zeros on the end of a 10, that's a probability. Or it's a probability that you win the lottery 22 times in a row. How many know that doesn't sound like coincidence to me? We have a great God who created the universe. Before there was anything, he made everything. Everything that you see, everything that you taste, everything that you can experience in life, God is the great creator. He's not a part of creation. He's above creation. He made everything, and in him we live and move and have our being. And every man knows in their heart, according to Romans chapter 1, we see the, the sunsets, we see the beautiful moon, we see the glories of creation, and there's something in us that says there is a creator. There's someone that did made us. We are made for more than just going to work, making money, paying our taxes, raising our kids, taking care of our aged parents, and one day getting retirement and one day dying. You are made for more than that. You were made for intimate relationship with a God of creation. He made you. He created you. You know, when Jesus came and when Paul wrote, at the fullness of time, Christ came at the fullness of time. At just the right time in history, Jesus came. Jesus was born in a time when the Romans had all the roads in place. There were, there were 250,000 miles of roads that were all across the 113 provinces of the Roman Empire, meaning that when Jesus was born, when Paul met the Lord, 
He was going to be a preacher, and he would walk down those roads, and he'd plant churches. If you read the second missionary journey, he went down the Via Inatia Road. He went to Philippi. He went to, started in Athens or Philippi, and then he went to Thessalonica, Berea. They're all on a road he went down. These roads were put in place for the gospel to spread. And there was a Greek language. Everybody spoke the same language. And so there was a common language. Everything was perfect in place. If you ever sit on the beach and you're sitting there and you're, you know, baking yourself in the sun and, and you see one of those airplanes fly by with a, with a, a restaurant advertisement carrying the banner, you ever see that? And, and, you know, all those banners are written in English. Why is that? Because everybody sitting on the beach pretty much speaks English. There's probably some Japanese people and German people in there, but pretty much everybody speaks English. And when the gospel came and when Jesus was born, there was one language that everybody knew. But the most important thing was when Jesus was born, there was a sense of great emptiness in the world. The Roman gods weren't getting it anymore. People believed in these crazy gods. All they did was fight with each other and slept with each other, and they were vindictive, and you had to make the Roman gods happy. If you didn't make the Roman gods happy, they were going to not give you good crops. And and the Romans were just sick of it. If you read in the New Testament, you read about these God-fearers, people that were going to the synagogues. When you read about a God-fearer in the book of Acts, what does that mean? It means these are Roman people that are sick of the Roman gods, and so they've come to the synagogue to hear about the one God. When Jesus was born, there was this disillusionment in the world. And Jesus came and he said, what did he say? I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Jesus came to bring life and not to bring it to us, you know, limitedly. He came to bring us life and bring it to us more abundantly. So he was born when men's hearts were empty. Maybe you're here today. And you're doing all the right stuff. You're getting good grades and if you're in school and you're trying to do the right thing or maybe you're working, taking care of your kids. You got your kids everywhere. You're taking them to soccer practice. You're doing everything and, and you're working hard and you're working around the clock. You got all this stuff going on. But there's something missing inside. There's a void inside. You know, it's just, it, there's got to be more. And that's what people were saying in Paul's day. We, uh, we had an Easter egg hunt with our grandkids the other day. We've got, uh, we got four grandkids, love our grandkids. Somebody said that, you know, God gives you grandkids to reward you for not killing your kids, you know, when they're growing up. <laughs> how, many got, how many got grandkids? Don't you love your grandkids? You love your kids, but you love your ki- grandkids. You know what I mean? So we were having an Easter egg hunt, and it was, happened to be on Thursday when it was raining, so we couldn't have it outside. So we had 100 of these eggs in the house. We had our Easter egg hunt in the house with our four grandkids. And uh, a couple years ago, we had, uh, we, had, we had a system where we had each grandkid had a certain color egg. They could only collect a certain color egg. We didn't want them fighting over the eggs. And uh, so one of the kids had green, another one blue, and different colors. And the kids hated it. They hated it. You know, it turns out they didn't like communism. Communism didn't work for them. <laughs> they wanted capitalism. They wanted to go for as many eggs as they could get. But uh, Karen, we were busy this week, a crazy week. And she said, listen, why don't we just put the eggs out with nothing in them and not have anything in them? Just have them look for the empty shells of the eggs. And I said, honey, you are beautiful. And... Uh, <laughs> You are intelligent, smarter than I'll ever be, and you're brilliant, but that's a bad idea. (laughs) That's a bad idea because there's no kid that wants to get an empty egg. They want an egg with something in it. If you're going to be pushing your cousin down the stairs, you want it to be worth it. You know what I mean? (laughs) And when you think about what happened In the Roman Empire, they're chasing an empty egg. It's not working. And maybe you're chasing an empty egg, you know, in your life. You say, well, I got friends. I got friends, you know. That's all I need in life is friends. Friends are, you know, great, you know. You know, uh, James Taylor, you know, friends. Got a friend. You got to, the friends are great. You know, we need friends. We're made for friends. But if your friends are your main purpose of living, When something happens to your relationships and your friendships, you're devastated because you're building your life on a secondary principle instead of a primary principle. 
there's a crazy movie out, and I'm not sure I can pronounce all the words, but the, the Banshees of Innersham. It came out last year, Colin Farrell and uh, uh, Brennan Gleeson. And Colin Farrell plays this guy on a little Irish island. This is a, a, an interesting movie. It's an interesting movie. I mean, it's one of the most interesting movies I've ever seen. This guy, uh, Calm, who is played by Gleason, or Brendan Gleason, decides he doesn't want to be uh, the, the other guy's friend anymore, uh, the guy played by Colin Farrell. Don't want to be his friend anymore. He says, you're dull. <laughs> you're dull. And if you talk to me anymore, he says, I'm going to cut off a finger every time you talk to me, which he ends up doing, which is really crazy. Colin Farrell, the character he plays, uh, Pierrick, is devastated because his life is built upon this one person, and he falls apart. If your life is built upon your children, we raise our kids, love our kids, have fun with our kids. I know people that their whole life is about their kids. You're supposed to raise your kids so they leave you and stand on their own feet and become functioning adults with their own friends. You've got to build your life around something bigger than your children. I know parents that, you know, their kids are 40 years old, and they're, they're calling them to make sure they, they got the cell phone bill paid. You know, that's crazy. If you build your life on your, on your kids, build your life on your friends, build your life on your career, one of these days people are going to say, you are too old, go home. Your life has to be built upon something greater than your friends, than your achievements, than your family. Your life needs to be built upon the Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. You shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. My dad, you know, I was talking about my dad. My dad found the Lord when he was in his early 30s. And, you know, I go take care of him some. On Tuesdays, a lot of times I'm at his house. And my dad lost my mom a couple, about four or five years ago. And just rattled my dad's life. And I'll go there on Tuesdays and I'll show up and I'll open the door. And my dad tells me all the time, I miss your mom. And that was a greater woman than your mom. And I'll go in the house and my dad will have his Bible open on his lap, reading the word, communing with the Lord. Everything in this world is transient except for the Lord. Everything is transient. And we need to build our life upon a foundation that will never, ever uh, change. The woman at the well in John chapter 4, she, had, she made it about relationships. She had five different husbands. She couldn't find the right guy. She thought, if I find the right guy, it's all going to work out. So she's coming to the well in the middle of the day because she's embarrassed because she's been so promiscuous. She's coming to the well in the middle of the day because nobody comes to the well in the middle of the day. And there Jesus is sitting on the well waiting for her. And he says to her, I'll give you water. I'll give you living water. And if you drink of this living water, you will never thirst again. We have an insatiable thirst in us that we need to have filled. There's a quote by uh, Blaise Pascal, the famous philosopher, mathematician, and he uh, wrote these incredible words. I'll read it off here. Blaise Pascal, you ever heard the idea of uh, there's a God-shaped void inside? And I'll end with this this morning. If you ever hear that phrase, there's a God-shaped void, it came from Blaise Pascal. Blaise Pascal says, what else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but there was once in man true happiness, of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there to help, he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. When I read that quote, that phrase, 
this infinite abyss. There's a bottomless pit inside of us that only an immutable and great God who we were created to glorify, when he fills that, that's what changes the rest of us. St. Augustine, who was promiscuous and wild and crazy, looking for meaning in life through pleasure, sexual pleasure, St. Augustine finally came to the end of himself, and he says, I am restless until I find my rest in you. I am restless until I find my rest in you. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Would you lift your hands, if you're a believer this morning, lift your hands to the Lord. Be reminded this Easter that it's true. It's not a made-up story. It's not, I hope so. It's a historically validated event that many, many people paid with their lives to confirm. Now, Lord, as we pray over this great auditorium this morning, all these people that are here, we thank you for the power of God that's here, the love of Jesus that's here to fill empty hearts. I pray for that person that's been trying to fill their life with the wrong thing. They feel so empty. I pray, Father, for that, that person that feels all alone and all isolated. Lord, call them back to you today to embrace the power of your glory and your kingdom. And Lord, those that don't know you today, we pray that they'll kneel before you and give their lives to you today. Now, I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'm going to ask everybody in the auditorium to pray it with me. And if you're here today and you're not a believer and you want to become a believer, that the Holy Spirit has tapped you on the shoulder as you have listened to this message, and that you know, Jesus, this thing is real, and I need to know Jesus. I was made for him. I want you to close your eyes and pray this with this, auditor, with this audience today. And as you pray it, you're praying it not to anybody other than Jesus himself. And let's all pray this out, together, out loud together. Right now, everybody, here we go. Say this, dear Lord, I believe in you. I know that your resurrection really happened. I put my faith in you. You died on the cross for my sins. I was guilty and deserve the judgment of death. But you died on the cross in my place. You took the worst things I've ever done, all my sins upon yourself, and you paid the price for my sins. Now, Lord, I know that you've been raised from the dead. And let's say this out loud, real loud together. Now, Lord... I surrender my life to you. I make you the Lord of my life and serve you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's celebrate the people that received the Lord this morning.